um, who's the UCLA um, yeah. Center for Health Policy Research and essentially the Department of Public Health as well. And she has uh, given a lecture to students here before in Monrovia, the DNP students, and I'm just, I was just excited that she could come and talk to you because uh, her work is very interesting and I thought you might find it um, fun to learn about. And Kevin is going to be um, taping us today, mm -hmm. taping Dr. Kingsman. So thank you for consenting. Absolutely. So it's my I'll pleasure I'll to be here. As well. He won't. He won't film you. <laughs> okay. So just so you know a little bit about my background, my training is actually in geriatric social work. Um, I'm currently at the Center for Health Policy Research, so I've sort of bridged the worlds of geriatric social work with a uh, tremendous interest in policies and programs um, that affect resources for older adults. And my focus is really on home and community-based resources. So I'm going to be talking about that today and sharing with you a little bit. And I understand you're all nurse practitioners uh, in training, and, um, and you're going to be working with uh, adults and older adults moving forward. And I like to believe we all eventually work with older adults, even if that's not our specialization. And we become them, and we have family members <laughs> who are becoming them, and, and so forth. So it's sort of a, a, a population that has, a, has an impact and interacts with all of us various uh, settings. So, um, so first, you know, in terms of the goals of what I wanted to cover today, I want to talk about community resources that are really outside, largely outside of clinical settings, um, and that are designed to promote and maintain the health and well-being of older adults. And in this conversation, I want to consider the full spectrum of care needs and really think about older adults who are the most healthy side of the spectrum to those who are the most frail and disabled. And then, uh, Given t time, um, I want to talk about some recent developments in home and community-based care, um, many of which are uh, coming out of the Affordable Care Act that was passed in 2010 and are now being rolled out and implemented. So hopefully we'll have time to touch on that. Um, but first, just a little bit to set the background in terms of the demographics of aging. And I, you may have heard many of these statistics before, but I do want to just sort of provide the backdrop um, and sort of why it's really important to think about and plan for the health and social care needs of older adults in this country. So the number of older, older people aged 65 and over will double over the next 35 years from 43 million currently to about 84 million in 2050. Um, and the share of older people will increase from about 13%, that was in 2010, to about 20% in 2030. So we're really sort of right on the edge of a pretty dramatic shift in our aging population. It's sort of happening, happening as we speak and will continue to grow. Um, by the time the last baby boomers uh, turned 65 in 2029, one in five Americans will be age 65 or older. So that's 20%. And by 2032, there are going to be more people who are over 65 than children under 15. So just to kind of keep it in perspective with the whole aging continuum. Um, also, by 2042, the U.S. population will be majority minority. More than half of the population will be non-white or Hispanic. Um, diversity is also going to increase among the older population, with minorities accounting for 60% of the growth in people over 65 years of age. Um, for example, Latinos are projected to constitute a growing share of the older population, increasing from 7% uh, in 2010 to 20% by 2050. So this is a pretty dramatic increase in a specific demographic bridge Lebanon group. So in terms of the health implications of the demographics, um, although people are living healthier longer on average, health remi remains a primary concern of aging. Um, death and disability rates are uh, decreasing, particularly for heart disease and stroke, but chronic disease prevalence in the older population remains high. So there are many age-related health conditions and diseases such as dementia, arthritis, and diabetes that affect quality of life and living arrangements for older people. Um, if the current dementia prevalence continues as it is, the population with dementia will more than double from an estimated 4.3 million um, as of 2010 to 11.4 million by 2050. So given the uh, number of age-related health conditions, it's no surprise that per capita health care spending increases with age. And annual per capita spending 
on those age 65 and over totaled 14,800 in 2004, and that's more than triple the amount spent on working age adults. So public spending, including Medicare and Medicaid, accounted for about two thirds of all spending for those uh, among those who are 65 plus. So, so when we think about providing care to older adults, it's really important, I think, to think about the whole continuum of care um, and health care and social care needs. And of course, these, these really do intersect at many points along the continuum of care. Um, given the growing demand and resources that are going to be required to really effectively um, manage and support older adults as they age, whether they're healthy or not, we have to really consider public and private and voluntary resources that are available to support this population. It's also important to think about a lot of geographic differences in the way services and supports are funded and delivered across the country. If you just think about recent example that's in the news a lot with Medicaid expansion, some states taking it, some not, this really has great implications for the services and programs that are available um, for older adults in, in different geographic locations in this country. Um, also, very important to consider, um, in addition to sort of medical needs, it's the physical, um, the social, and the cultural environment in which older adults live, and how that affects their health outcomes. So, um, I mentioned already greater, I just, you know, hold up on that for a second, a uh, great variation across, within and across states and regions because of different funding mechanisms, Programs that I'm going to touch on a little bit today, they may have a different name in a different state. So from one state to the next, it might be a similar social support program, but they'll call it something else. Um, all these programs may have varying eligibility requirements, both in terms of age, um, in terms of income requirements and assets. Um, and then there are different benefits and program components that we want to consider. So with the physical environment, we're thinking about available adequate and, and accessible resources. Physical environment would include air and water quality, um, transportation options, housing, safe places outdoors, walkable communities, and so forth. So, so really thinking very broadly about where all of these health and social care needs occur. Um, the social environment would con con uh, include family, friend, uh, community networks, perhaps uh, work, workplace, um, relationships that are also important for, for providing support for older adults. And then when we think about cultural environments, that can include uh, services that really match consumer norms that are provided in language that, that the person understands and is able to communicate in. Often certain traditions, family traditions, uh, traditions related to food and music. Um, and then more concretely, are services offered in, in the language that people speak? So we have to think sort of broadly with cultural uh, environment, but also can someone understand when, they're, when their health care provider is communicating with them, when their social, social care provider is communicating with them. So aging in place is a term that's used often in gerontology, and it really reflects the desire of most older adults to stay in the place um, and stay where they have lived, perhaps, for a long period of time. Um, most older adults prefer to stay at home than to move into institutional care. I mean, there are some exceptions, but um, most surveys have shown that the vast majority, not well over 95% of people want to stay at home um, if it's at all feasible for them to do so, even often with multiple chronic conditions and very high levels of disability. Um, so when we think about the community and the physical environment, we want to think about first where older adults are living. In California, about three quarters of Californians who are over 65 actually own their own homes. And this is a large percentage, right? But many may not be able to afford the long-term services and supports that they actually need as they live longer with increasing disability. So this is, this is where this really becomes an issue that cuts across all classes. Um, it's not just an issue of uh, lower income, income or higher income folks, if, if the supports are not available to stay in the home, uh, this can become uh, an issue. Um, there are a number of alternative housing arrangements, and a lot of that does depend on individual resources, uh, the level of income, fixed income that most older adults are on, um, savings, um, and whether people are eligible for, for public support. 
Um, and then again, in terms of uh, housing, it depends what's available. I mean, you know in California there's housing shortages and there's, um, there's a lot of neighborhoods that become gentrified um, because California is such a desirable place, especially in the coastal areas. So neighborhoods become gentrified and then people who may have lived and aged in those neighborhoods for years and decades sometimes get pushed out. Uh, because they can no longer afford to continue living either in their house, you know, the actual housing uh, unit, um, and even if they own the house, it can be the cost of living in the immediate area that really just becomes untenable. So, so these are important things to consider. Um, there are a number of different housing arrangements. I'm going to just touch briefly on them, um, sort of alternative, what's called alternative housing arrangements. When we talk about NORCs, which are nat <coughs> naturally occurring retirement communities, this is the phenomenon where um, a, a whole neighborhood or a whole building perhaps of, of people age over time and, and that community becomes uh, a naturally occurring retirement community. It's not that it was somebody said, oh, we're going to make this a retirement community, but there's a cohort of people who stayed in the same building and now they're getting older. Um, and this is a very interesting phenomenon. So what the government has done, um, there are some limited resources uh, to support these communities and there some are vertical and some are horizontal so in a more rural area they may be neighborhoods it might be blocks where the whole neighborhood is aging and in inner city areas it may be high-rises right and so the government um, several well, a couple of decades ago I think back in the late 70s mm -hmm. early 80s uh, recognized that this is an opportunity to bring services to where people were living and aging anyway so there's something that's called the NORC SSP which is a supplemental support program which community-based organizations that are surrounding the areas where older people are naturally aging recognize this growing trend and need amongst this cohort, and they can bring social services to that to that neighborhood or to that building. Um, so I think that that, along with a number of other options, are going to become increasingly important um, as these numbers as that I, I talked about in my first slide, as these numbers of the numbers of older adults increase. Um, another concept that's been gaining popularity is called a village concept. And this, these are really sort of um, grassroots efforts where people who live in a particular neighborhood identify that, that they, are, they are aging and they want to find a way to create more of a, a, a strong fabric in the community. If it didn't exist, sometimes it, it was pre-existing, you know, sort of a social network, but other times People, as they've gotten older and their kids move out, they recognize, well, you know, my kids aren't here to help me. I'm getting older, I need more help. Now I want to turn to the neighbor across the street. So maybe they can drive me to the pharmacy because I need my medication and I can't drive anymore. And then maybe somebody else can put their name into sort of like a, a time bank and, and say, I can help out with, you know, cooking or I can help out with um, uh, repairs. You know, I can help you with your gardening. So. These village concepts are coming up, and they, so far they're coming up largely in um, higher income communities, um, but there are more recent efforts to, and, and interest in really trying these concepts out in, across, the, across the board. So it, it's not just, um, you know, the, the ones that are coming up in some of the upper income communities have sort of a concierge model that some of them use. Um, they, they, they really vary. Some of them bring in, you know, sort of a medical um, uh, health component, a more explicit health component by having um, services brought to the community, um, health services brought to the community, or uh, people paying into a, a, a sort of like an insurance pool to provide supplemental services um, that are more convenient to access because they're right there geographically. So keep your ear out for the village concepts, and I'm really interested to see how that translates when they really work on developing the same concept in different neighborhoods, mm -hmm. um, because a lot of neighborhoods already have a strong social fabric across um, all socioeconomic lines. And if they build on other ideas, like time banks that already exist, I think that this could be another way that the, the, the needs of older adults um, are, are met. Um, there are government programs that provide some, some um, subsidies for um, for low-income seniors, federal housing programs, and so forth. Um, unfortunately, um, the, the HUD, the Housing and Urban Development Senior Housing Assistance Programs, only serve about 10% of low-income elderly, so it's really not uh, reaching all, all of the need. It's not, it's, the demand really exceeds the supply, and there are long waiting lists to get into these 
public housing uh, units. Um, and then there are a couple of senior age, there are other options that are senior age restricted apartments for 55 plus or 62 plus. Um, and these are all ar arranged, organized around the idea of promoting social engagement, um, but they don't, don't provide social support services necessarily or health care. Um, and then there are residential care facilities, which I imagine you're mostly familiar with. Those include boarding care and congregate housing, assisted living facilities, um, independent living facilities, and then residential care for the elderly. But this is all of the groups, uh, not excluding skilled nursing. Uh, any questions or comments? I'm going on, so please, you know, feel free to ask questions or interrupt me at any. So, um, so there are a number of programs and services that are available that support individuals who are successfully aging in place. And most of these are part of what's called an aging network of services. Um, the National Council on Aging is a professional organization um, that has a healthy aging program um, and it focuses a lot on uh, promoting and providing technical assistance and support for evidence-based programs that are launched and implemented in the community. And these are uh, programs that support uh, disease prevention, health promotion, and we'll talk about a couple of them briefly. Um, and then the, the Centers for Disease Control also has a healthy aging program, and they provide um, a lot of good information is available on their healthy aging uh, website, um, information with the resources, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about what they're focused on currently. Um, but first, the National Council on Aging, uh, the Center for Healthy Aging, these are the typical set of programs that they promote and provide a technical assistance for, for community-based organizations who implement these. And these are, many work in tandem with, with healthcare facilities. Um, the Chronic Disease Self-Management Programs, have you heard of those, familiar with those? Yeah, chronic disease. Okay, and these are, um, most typically, they're really peer-led groups. Mm -hmm. So somebody, uh, a corollary would be a di uh, diabetes prevention program, mm -hmm. but it can be for any chronic disease. They have self-management programs for pain um, management as well, but it's peer-led. So, mm -hmm. so somebody who has the particular disease um, or health challenge is the one that can help uh, facilitate discussion about what are the, mm -hmm. You know, what are the dietary things I can do to help um, manage this condition? What are the psychological, social things I can do that can help me get through tough times or pain and so forth? Um, so, so they have evidence-based programs with manuals. I mean, these are all these have all been tested and found to be effective. Uh, false prevention is another um, another. Oh, and I should mention the chronic disease self-management. In addition to in person, they're available online. And one of the the large. Uh, sort resources for the development and implementation is Stanford University, um, where Kate Lorig actually developed many of these, and, um, and there, there are a number of resources there for these, these programs. Um, false prevention programs, um, again, community organizations um, that are in part, of the, part of an aging network provide programs that reduce the fear of falling and help prevent falls. Um, and there are a number of physical activity programs um, such as enhanced fitness, and that you know that's one example that offers fitness uh, for all levels of, of function. Um, healthy moves for aging well is um, activity for frail seniors who are at home. So again, you know, sort of thinking about the healthy seniors who can go out and do exercise or physical activity in a community center, set, uh, center or setting, and then there are other programs that bring these interventions to the home for those who really don't have the capacity. Um, and then there are a number of evidence-based programs that are focused on behavioral health. Um, and these are proven community-based programs that address mental health needs, um, substance abuse issues with older adults. Uh, one example is called PEARLS, which is an evidence-based, um, home-based uh, depression intervention for older adults, again, who are socially isolated. And this really can make an incredible difference in their, uh, not only their emotional health, but in their physical health to yeah. get through social isolation and, and depression. Um, the CDC, which I mentioned before, th these are some of the initiatives they've been working on most recently. They have a Healthy Brain Initiative. Um, another focus is emergency uh, prepar preparedness in older adults. Did anybody feel the earthquake yesterday? Yes. <laughs> and there were a couple, a couple I heard. Yeah. There were a couple, right? Um, and, 
And then uh, Clinical Preventive Services, they have a couple of publications on their website. And this, this is um, actually another pro a pro one of the projects I'm working on currently, which is um, finding places in the community to promote um, clinical preventive service use among the 50 plus population. So things like uh, you know mammogram, colorectal cancer screening, flu shots, pneumococcal vaccinations, and so forth, even though uh, these are now covered with no cost sharing through the Affordable Care Act um, provisions. These aren't, they are not anywhere near the desired uptake rate that they should be. So there are other reasons that are getting in the way. There are other factors that are getting in the way of people getting these services. So uh, a big focus on this, on this area currently is to find places in the community where people already are, whether it's at their church, if it's at their barber shop, if it's at, um, if it's at a community center, or if it's at a pharmacy, exactly. And they even have programs in the airports. Have yeah, yeah. seen the aer aero clinics, they call them? Um, that's, that's a growing trend, too, where they're providing primary care in airports. But, but even just flu shots, for example. Those, those make sense, right? You're on your way, you're, you're waiting for to board, and you can get a flu shot. That's usually out of pocket. So, so even even with all the provisions of the Affordable Care Act, I think those are still for-profit um, uh, ventures. Um, but the focus of the clinical preventive service work is really to to find places to educate and, and increase awareness, and then most importantly is beyond doing that, it's really directing people to the source of care where they can get these services. So. They're not going to start doing colonoscopies in the church basement, <laughs> so but they might be able to talk about where can you go to get the screening that you need and and get you connected with a primary care provider who can give you the counseling that you need to know what you need to do. Um, and and because the the value of this, of course, is catching things upstream. And I think that people don't always think about older adults and prevention in the same sentence. Yeah, that's because, true. Because you know you think older adults, oh, they're really they all have lots of chronic conditions and they're on their way to dying and you know I'm being a little impressed but well I think they already have it yeah. so there's no point so that, that you know they kind of generally speaking a lot of people think that uh, older adults already have chronic disease so kind of prevention is not part of the psyche right in a way, right which is a problem it is and it, and if if we did get a little more upstream and, and that 50 to 64 year old group is particularly important because one number of the recommended recommendations start at age 50 right um, for mammography, for colorectal cancer screening. Uh, some are 65 plus for pneumo vaccination. Um, but then there are people with other risk factors who might need a pneumo vax earlier than that. So, but the idea is if you're getting people earlier, you can really prevent some, prevent some of these chronic conditions mm -hmm. or at least help delay onset and, and so forth. So there's a lot of value in it. Well, even things like physical activity, even if people haven't been really active earlier, they can still build up. Even if they start. I can start at 50. Even yeah, starting. Or later. Uh, even later, matter. yeah. It's really quite incredible. So, so there is, I think, a lot of work to be done to change the mindset. It, a lot of it goes back to sort of, we have a very ageist society mm -hmm. and in general. And just look at the, next time you go to the, to the pharmacy and look at greeting cards mm -hmm. and look at uh, the, all of the cards about birthdays and aging, and there's no end to how many stereotypes there are about what it means to get older. Yeah. So, so that pervades in every discipline, I think, in every corner of our society. Oh, that's my little soapbox, I'll get off of that. <laughs> so, okay, so um, another area that, um, and you're gonna hear more about this later from another guest who's gonna join you via Skype. Yeah, right? Or I think go to a meeting. I think we're gonna try to go to a meeting. If oh, that okay. doesn't work, we'll do a okay. Skype backup. Um, but this is an area that also has been um, neglected in, it's in, in prevention, but, we're, but I'm talking about elder abuse prevention. And um, it really needs more attention, and there's been federal legislation um, on this issue for some time, um, many, many years in the making, and it finally passed. The Elder Justice Act is what it's called, part of the Affordable Care Act. It passed in 2010 took uh, five years to get any funding, but last year just got some funding, so this is really great. Um, and it's been a top concern of the Assistant Secretary um, for the Administration on Community Living, which was formerly known as the Administration on Aging. Um, and she's really been working hard, um, as have been many, many advocates, to keep this issue front and center. So I wanted to play a little um, video clip. Oh yeah, so I just get to it.
people in this country like to talk with them. Most people think of elder abuse as somebody uh, beating an older person. Is it one of the most invisible crimes? Was there anything else for me to say, finally? And I think that that's why they took advantage of that. They'd always steal everything, whether it was money or, or jewelry. I think one of the things we bump up against with elder abuse is uh, shame, embarrassment, uh, capacity. There is elder abuse occurring in probably every zip code in the United States. Elder abuse is a dark mark on our humanity. We're all going to get old, and we're all going to be potential victims. We're so conscious of all kinds of human rights. This is an extremely basic human right. Elder abuse is a national problem. It's only going to get worse with the aging of the population. We need to have a systemic approach to this so that when our children or our children's children become senior citizens, that they don't face the same abuse and neglect that our seniors face today. My aunt has always been the type of person that adapted to whatever was around her. Very, very strong woman. And nothing much scares her very badly. She just adapts. I don't need nobody. She's the only one to take care of me. <laughs> My aunt's um, son, who is the grandson's father, actually was having some financial problems and needed to sell her home very quickly. Um, the mother had already died a couple years before. They moved in here, then he died, and the grandkids were left behind. Um, and then as they got older, things just got even more wilder with their involvement with things, drugs and such. So that even though we had seen a lot of things going on or a lot of activity, people in and out, we kept checking and she thought everything was still kind of fine. But one day my mom came home from visiting her and said, do you know that your aunt has a security door? on her bedroom now. When we went to the house, we found that there was a metal security grate type door on her bedroom. So it was a very remarkable situation. Uh, we had spent hundreds, thousands of hours in the last um, three years here dealing with crime directly related with this house and kind of in concentric circles away from the house. They had informed me that the um, city of Hayward was looking to take her home, sell her home, put her in a rest home, and that that, in my opinion, would kill her. She wouldn't have her home, she wouldn't have her garden. So I came over, I asked her to come and have lunch with me so I could get her away from all the busyness that was here. And I told her, do you realize what's going on? And she was starting to realize what was and the potential of that thing. And I asked her, can I help you? If you allow me to. And she said yes. So the very next opportunity we had to uh, do this problem housing abatement program called SMASH, uh, we brought here. We found uh, Ms. Bastion, the homeowner. Uh, we found her grandson, several people who were part of local gangs, some people that were on parole, and um, a bunch of people who were under the influence of heroin. Uh, it was really sad. We have so many cases where an elderly person is living in their own home, they own the home outright, and their children or their grandchildren or um, a caregiver slowly takes over. And the elderly person becomes the prisoner in their own home. Elder mistreatment means to me, it means self-neglect where an elder is not able to take care of himself or herself and it means neglect by others. A long time. So, um, part of the reason for the Elder Justice Act, the reason that it was being championed for so long is that we don't really know a lot, um, even still, about the how many people are suffering from elder abuse and neglect. Um, it does appear that females are abused at a higher rate than males, 
and that also that the older one is, the more likely one is to be abused. Did stop. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to play another. Yeah, another coming up. Okay. Yeah. Um, so. Um, the signs of elder abuse may be missed by professionals working with older Americans because of the lack of training on detecting abuse. And the elderly may be reluctant to report abuse themselves. And because of fear of retaliation, uh, lack of physical or cognitive ability to report, um, or because they don't want to get the abuser in trouble. And unfortunately, about 90% of the time, um, the abuser is a family member. 